seated. So we have the the the, the place of the uh, of, of where 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 the balance sits, the, there, where the old self is and where the new self is. There's this moment of time that you cannot be you cannot occupy both spaces at the time at the same time. So that's why the usage of the phrase "but now," which indicates that where you currently are was once was once filled with these things that are. That, that would have marked your old self. Immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, and greed, which, by the way, the Apostle says, this accounts for and amounts to idolatry. This is th anything that we have in our lives that is greater than, th th than the Almighty Himself, then we are filling our lives with that which would lead us into idolatry. But, but not now, he says. This, this cannot take up the same space. That, that had to be then and th this is now. It's like when you say, yesterday I was sick, but now I, I feel better. So, so you cannot be sick and healthy at the same time. There has to be something that marks the difference between the previous and the now. The, the previous. You could, you could say, yesterday I was well and today I'm sick. You're still making a distinctive mark. You're not taking up the same space at the same time. There's something that is that is marked differently. I used to believe this, but now I believe this. I used to believe I could get to heaven on my own righteousness, but now I know I need Christ. I used to believe that I didn't need to gather with the saints, but now I know it's really important that I do. I used to believe that singing was just Something that, that got ready for this moment. But now I know that singing is as important and an expression of what the church does altogether in its totality. I used to believe this. Now I believe this. I was, so not only is it a, a, a something that takes up the space in the mind and the, ver and the very presence, the very being of who you are, but it also is an expression of location. I used to be over there, but now I'm over here. You cannot be over there and here at the same time. And you might be able to see over there while you're over here, but you cannot be in both places. There's, so there's a marker that says this and then that. I used to be at my house, but now I'm at the church house. I cannot. It's, it's physically impossible for me to be there and here at the same time. I, I used to like ice cream. Okay, I don't know. I don't know how that even fits here because I still like ice cream. But you, 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 you see, you can't have one position. I used to not like broccoli, but now I. Well, you, the, the, yeah, I, I can. I can eat it anyway, and I and I should. Boys and girls, you, you should always eat the broccoli. But but in this in this particular position of what Colossians, what what the Apostle Paul is wanting us to see, there is something that cannot be the exact same by the now marker. And what is it that changed that? And we, 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 we see it in the text. We see it and we know it from the whole of the Word of God. The thing that marks the difference is the blood of Christ. I once was lost, but now found. I, I once deserved the full wrath of God, but now, because of the grace of God, I get to share as a joint heir with Christ in the heavenlies. I, I, that was then. This is now. Location, state of mind, this and that. So he says these things have been marked. And the apostle makes it very clear what these markers were. That the two cannot take up the same space at the same time. So walking in these ways uh, of, of the past uh, are, are clear for us to see that we can no longer walk in them now if we're going to make claim to be a born-again believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, as we think about this in the deep sense of it, you as a born-again believer cannot take up residency and joy and pleasure in walking how you once walked. You cannot make claim to be walking in righteousness while in all reality you're walking in evil sin. So there is this 
this, the, 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 a noted problem for us. How is it then, do we no longer walk like this, but now walk like this? And the Apostle helps us see this in verse 8. But now you also put them, that them, keep in mind is this, the immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and greed, idolatry. Put them all aside. And then he, it's not that he's introducing a new list for us, but perhaps we can better see that immorality is in our life or that impurity is present or that, that worldly passions or evil desires or greed, which is idolatry, that we, we can better see them by noting the anger, the wrath, the malice, the slander, the abusive speech that comes from our mouths, the, the bearing false witness with those who make profession of being followers of the Lord Jesus Christ as well. This is this would be one way to help you identify that the list of these things that you once were are still present. And so if you're if you're if you're of those who make claim to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, look closely at these markers that say this is this is evident that you 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 you're you're either stumbling or struggling or if you're residing there that you really you're not a born again believer. Not because of your walking, but the walking, the place in which you are, or the, the state of mind in which your mind is at, bears evidence of that work that did or did not take place. Not your work, but the work of Christ. So I think it might be helpful for us to then think back upon those, those attributes that are described there in verse 8 before we get to the, the, the new location. So we once were like this, but now we're like this. We'll look at that, but let's make sure we've got a good understanding of this. There's anger, he talks about in verse 8. So, so this is, this is self a self-examination moment. It's a moment for you to let the Word of God come and, and expose in your life the, the work of the flesh or the work of the Spirit, as the Apostle would describe it both in Romans and in his letters to the church in Corinth, that which is governed by the flesh or that which is governed by the spirit, is there? Is, is so anger is one of those things. Can 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 you make claim to being currently walking in the power of the Holy Spirit upon your life while at the same time expressing a violent outburst of anger? Now let's let's make sure we get a couple of things right here. We're going to look. We're going to look closely at two of three church doctrines. We'll look at the third doctrine more closely, Lord willing, next week. But we'll need to see these doctrines that are important for us. First is the sufficiency of Christ. The second doctrine is the doctrine of sanctification. Sanctification is will be the one that we'll look at the closest. And then, again, Lord willing, we'll, we'll look at the doctrine of election uh, next Sunday. Uh, if the Lord allows in the time to pass on in that manner. So anger is one of those things that we can put into this doctrine of sanctification. It is possible for you to sin in your anger while still being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you cannot remain in that anger without the power of Christ to not convict you of the wrong of it. So this, would be the, the, this is what happens now. Before you didn't have the convicting work of the Holy Spirit to show you, to expose to you that your anger was sinful. And so you just indulged in it. You just practiced it. And that anger led you to immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, greed. In other words, idolatry. So the, 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 the second list in verse 8 is really not a second list. It is really a way in which you can identify this exposes my current condition, my, my current location. If you are engulfed in anger, it doesn't mean you're not saved, it doesn't mean you're not born again, but in the moment you have not set it aside, which is that which is of your old self, so what are, you, what are you going to, how do you identify what is it, what's going on whenever that's present and being expressed and practiced at the moment? Anger, to get a best understanding of it, is a violent passion of the mind. 
That's, that's really essentially what anger is. You, see, you think about the times when you get angry. It really is a violent passion. It's, a violent, it's an expression of a violent passion in your mind. You wanted something and it didn't happen. And so you act out in a violent passion of the, of the dissatisfaction of the, of the outcome that you were hoping for, or for that matter, even manipulating. And so you grow angry because it didn't work out the way you wanted it to. This, this, this is really a damaging attribute that all of us possess in our old man. That old nature shows up from time to time, doesn't he, doesn't she? And, oh, what a, what a grace from God that he would forgive us of it. But today, if there is notably upon you, even if there has been recently a violent passion in your mind in the way it came out of your expression toward a loved one, toward a neighbor, toward a member of your church family, someone at your workhouse, that would be the work of the Spirit of God to expose to you that you don't want to remain in that condition. Because left unchecked, left unconvicted of, unconverted from, or, or, or not repented in, leads us down the pathway of immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, greed, and idolatry. Almost as though it's the same thing, but the apostle includes this word that we would have wrath. So in verse 8, so, so, so keep in mind that, that the difference here is not, we, we haven't got to that which is different than the previous. He's just expressing the previous in this manner to help us know, is, are these things present in us? And how is it showing out wrath? Would be, if, if anger is a violent passion of the mind, then wrath has to be the actual doing of what's in the mind. This would be how the Apostle, or how the Lord Jesus Christ would say in the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard it said of old, you shall not murder. But I say to you, you shall not hate your brother. So, that, so one, is, one is the actual doing of, the other is thinking the worst of. The, so, so the Bible makes no distinctive difference between the two. They're both dangerous for you. They're both dangerous for you to take possession of. It's risky for you to hold anger, angst, that which you, that, that you want bad. You want, you, want, you want the individual to be shown in a negative light. Wrath means, okay, apparently it's not working, so I'm going to have to take things into my own hands and make sure that they get what they deserve. The believer has forgotten then that vengeance belongs to the Lord. So wrath is the actual following through with whether it be verbal or physical, but it's an explosive retaliation. It is an unrestrained verbal or physical action. Isn't that a tragic marker that still wants to latch itself onto our souls from time to time? That's, that, that's where we once were. But now, verse 8, and we've got to get through these things, these things that, that actually show the previous before we can get to the, to the current condition which is radically different than the previous. Then he moves on, for not only anger and wrath, and how they're, how, so notice them, are they present in you? Do you want these things to happen like this? Are you actively making sure that retaliation is given to the individual? These are not attributes of the born-again believer. These are attributes of your rebellious, sinful cravings, which really are rooted in idolatry. If vengeance is mine, and you take vengeance upon yourself, you're practicing idolatry because you've placed yourself as God. You've taken on yourself an attribute that God says, trust me here, I got this. And, and your action to do it on your own is saying, I don't trust God, so I'm going to be God for myself for a moment. And I'm going to retaliate. <clears throat> Vengeance is God's. It is not ours. Malice is the third of the attributes that are listed here that are still attached to the immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, greed, 
idolatry. So, verse, in, in verse 8, put all these aside. So, so, so you put those aside, and notice these are the things that will be the closest markers to you that those are still present. Anger, wrath, malice. Malice is extreme or extraordinary enmity of the heart. It is a disposition to cause injury. So you see they're similar. Anger wants injury to happen. Wrath actually instigates the pathway for it. But malice says you take an active role in it. You, wrath could happen by you just causing something to create the harm. But malice includes you doing the harm. It's not just making a baseball bat available for someone who's mad at somebody else or something else and so they might come along and pick it up and use it. Malice is you pick up the baseball bat and you use it in your anger, in your wrath, your malice. So they, 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 it really is a personal gratification that exists in the soul. And this would be that which is where you once were. These, these, these attributes, whether you actually acted out in these kinds of outbursts, your disposition may not, may not have lent yourself to that disposition even in an unbelieved state, but the root of them were still present in you. It's many times we think some, some of the most vile and vicious people in world history, how is it possible that they did the things that they did in all reality, the common grace of God is what restrains you from being even worse than they were. Because you possess in your sin the capacity to do all of this. The apostles say, and if you're not, if you're not aware of this, if your spiritual eyes are not open, and you're not repenting of these things that are present, which really is to the conclusion of, it is all idolatry. Slander is the next one. Now, slander is, is not so much in the physical as it is more in the verbal. Uh, the, the other, wrath and malice, would probably be easier to be seen in the physical, but they can be verbal as well. But slander certainly is this. It is the intentionality of, of either advancing someone else's false report about another or you beginning the false report. Of another both of that is slander it's possible for you to participate in slander and I would even argue this it's even possible for you to participate in slander if you don't fully know all of the circumstances you can unbeknownst to you this would be what the what, what the Bible would call gossip you participate in spread and in spreading information that seems to a reasonable person to be true about that person you're wanting to slander but this is with the intent to make the other person in a negative light on purpose. So someone has done something and you, you in your wrath and in your malice and in your anger, you don't like that they get, they, they get the advance, that they get the promotion. You don't like that, they, that, that they're known as the leader. And so you start a campaign to slander them. And you start it in a malicious manner. You start it in a, in a manner... Uh, either by the propagating of a false claim or false report about the individual or you begin one yourself. Slander is a false report with the intention of causing injury to the reputation of another. And I think it would be important that, you, that when we, we don't just say another, but that the Christian must think about when we think about another. We, we, we cause intentional harm to the reputation of any other born again believer or unbeliever nonetheless both image bearers of the almighty god you imagine the kind of idolatry that is present in your being that you would desire to slander another image bearer of the almighty god can you imagine the level of idolatry that you have taken upon to yourself to think that you have the right to slander another image bearer of God? 
Now I know some will want to make an argument, truth is truth, and listen, if it slanders and hurts them, then that's on them. Well, truth is always the truth. But what's the intent behind why we want to propagate it, why we want to advance it? Is it because we need to give warning to people? That's not slander. If it's based in truth and it's been compassion for both the one who is doing the slander or doing the wrong thing or the one who's going to be harmed by the wrong thing, that's not slander. But if behind the scene or perhaps even out in the front of the scene, you're doing something to cause the ill reputation of another that is not based in truth, then you're participating in slander. And you may not even know it. See how, you see how dangerous idolatry is? He furthers not only anger and wrath and malice and slander, but then he uses this, this, this clearer, more helpful description, this attribute here of abusive speech. Now this, this is not just being, this, this is not just the slander which was previously addressed, the, the, the false report of another. That's abusive speech, by the way. So understand that that, that, that would be how the, how the apostle would incorporate into this, in this, into this category of slander, would, it, would could possibly even include abusive speech, because you are falsely reporting of an individual's reputation, that that would be slander, false, abusive speech. But also, note this, that the, the very way in which you speak, your coarse, vulgar, ill intense, ill intention, these, these things that are really more of, of an abusive speech with the intent to cause slander. The, the, the motivation is at a deeper, coarser, vulgar way. It's, it's, it is, again, attached to that old self who has no restraints on the way in which you speak. Now, in, in, in days past, and perhaps it's still present in some circles, but there, there were times whenever uh, there, there was a double standard. Let me start here. There was a double standard in times past that men, it was it's so, somewhat culturally acceptable that men would use a more coarse or vulgar language and that women wouldn't. And, and that whenever men were around women and they were using their coarse and their vulgar language, someone with at least some kind of respect for women would say, hey, 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 we, we don't talk like that around women. Which I, I, think, I think it's good. Don't, don't think that I think you shouldn't interrupt that kind of vulgar, coarse kind of language. I would say largely, culturally, it's a, it's a great tragedy that that's really rarely even on us anymore. And quite frankly, sadly, many conversations you'll hear that are in the vulgar tones come from both men and women, equally so. I, I cannot tell you how, how more often in my bus driving days that I would have to stop the bus and address a girl on the bus about her vulgar language than I did the boys. The, the cultural shift is one, but then laying upon the born-again believer, that was how we once were. But now, there is something that is radically different about men and women. No, this, 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 this different kind of speech is not just something that women get sanctified in. This is something that even is a sanctifying work upon the men. We drop. We, it, may not, it, may not, it may not get off of us altogether, but it's notably on the mind while we're entangled in it that we want to put it off. We want to take it off of our speech. We, we, don't, we don't want it to come out like this any longer. We want to be seasoned with saying truthful things without having to be coarse and vulgar and ill-intended with our speech. Sticks and stones may break my bones, they say, right? And words will never harm me. That's, that's one of the greatest advanced lies in all of society. The apostle here is warning us, be careful with your speech. It causes deep pain. 
That's how we once were. But it's not how we are now. It's not how we should be. This should not be that which marks us. If you're going to be known as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ in this community in Twin Falls, Idaho, and there is no restraint on your speech, and I would say today to you, look closely with the power of the Holy Spirit that He may begin to help you take that off. Shed that, 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 that propensity. It doesn't mean you're not born again. Don't, don't hear me wrong in this. But if there's nothing about you that wants to curb that, that wants to shed that, that wants to put it off, that wants to kill it, then perhaps you might then be looking at the condition of your heart, saved or unsaved. But we know that the apostle is speaking to, to, to believers because that's the intent of the letter. I would take you back to the first verses of Colossians. He is writing to the church. So this, 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 these attributes are not intended just for the church to grow in her self-righteousness and say, this is how the world is. Well, the apostle is saying, this is how some of you are even now. And this should not be so. And so this is, this is, as we'll look at, the doctrine of sanctification is, is happening on the very pages of Colossians chapter 3. The third, or, or excuse me, the third, this is like number six, the sixth attribute here on in verse 8 as we move into verse 9 is do not lie to one another do not bear false witness to one another now we have a commandment boys and girls we're looking through those 10 commandments we're going to get to one that says you shall not bear false witness in other words you shall not lie this is true for the believer but even more so for the believer you shall not lie to one another this is very peculiar, not in the sense of that's strange, but peculiar in the, in the reality here that there, there is at times even the propensity for those professing believers to bear false witness to each other. Perhaps is even one of the worst, one of the worst conditions of the believer is that he only pretends to his, to his, to his fellow believers. When he's not at the church house, he's not pretending to anybody. He's, his language is seasoned with vulgarity. He's, he's constantly advancing or causing slander. He has malice intense in his heart. He's, he's vehemently ex exasperating uh, in, in his explosive retaliation and, 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 and with his verbal and his physical, the wrath that's, that's embittered him. And this anger that lives inside of him. Well, the Apostle Paul wants to come down and say, here, here's something that ought to be the easiest thing for you to take off. And that is your tendency to want to pretend to brothers that you got it more together than you really do. Do not lie to one another. Do not, do not just clothe yourself with a smile on Sunday morning so that the other believers will think how spiritual you are. Do not bear false witness to each other. Listen, I think, I think it's an appropriate, it's, it's a common greeting. Hey, how are you doing? It's common for us to say, well, you know, I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm well. You can at least say in the physical sense, today I'm well. I'm grateful for that. But there, there, for the believer, I think this is, this is indicative of the kind of expressions, the way the apostle would tell the church how you ought to greet one another. He says, greet one another with a holy kiss means with an honest expression. Hey, how, how are you doing today? You know what, I'm really, you know, you, since you asked, I just got to tell you, I'm really mad right now. <laughs> uh, then you might need to take a deep breath, take a drink of water, and, and then talk in a softer tone so that the brother can pray for you. Hey, how, how are you doing today? Listen, I don't know if my marriage is going to make it. Hey, how, how are you doing today? I, I don't know, my, my children are so rebellious. I don't, I don't know how to help them overcome their rebellion. Whenever we express to one another in honesty, are we better fit to pray for one another? Are we better designed to then to be a true expression? Yes, I'm grateful and I'm thankful to the Lord for my salvation. That's, that's actually a good response. How are you today? Well, i got to tell you this, if it's not for the grace of God, I know I, I've ruined it all. 
my, my, my week has been just like that. I, I, I've slandered against a fellow co-worker today. I've, I've spread slander against a brother I worship in this same room with. I, I've spoken behind the backs of one another so that others will think of me as better than them. I've bore false witness. This, this is what the apostle is saying. For the believer, the Spirit of God doesn't let him live like this, not comfortably, and not for long. This is all, all of these the, the anger, the wrath, the malice, the slander, the abusive speech, the, the bearing false witness. Listen, these are natural actions, natural attributes of the previous life where I once was there. I get it, that, that, that used to be on me. But now I'm here, and yes, when I came here, I brought a lot of the attributes from my old man over there. But the Apostle Paul is saying, set them aside. Take them off. He's using the language of put them to death. Severe way in which he wants to describe it. That which you would treat a skin cancer or a gangrene. You better deal with it, and you better deal with it immediately. Because if you don't, it's about to suffocate, and it's about to kill off more than it currently has. That which would be, that which would be leading to idolatry. So we have two primary doctrines that we want to have on us as we make application here. We have the sufficiency of Christ, and we have the doctrine of sanctification. So let's, let's move... Let, let's move from the, that was where we once were, and now let's move into the glorious place of where Christ has brought us to. So let's bring verse 8 with us as we move forward. But now, you also put them, now that them, you, you followed the grammar as it's fitting here. Them is the immorality, the impurity, the passions, the evil desires. These are the, that which is listed in verse 5. Uh, the, the evil desires, the greed, the idolatry. But now, you also put them all aside. And then he helps us. This is how you'll best see it. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech. R remove all this from your mouth. And do not bear false witness to one another. Do not lie to one another, to one another since you laid aside the old self. So he's saying previously, put them all aside. And now he's saying... Because you're here now, he's speaking of it in the past tense. Since you did that, since you left the old man, since you laid aside the old man, since you mortified the old man and its evil practices. And that's everything that was listed in verse 8. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech, bearing false, false witness to one another. You've laid them all aside. And you can do that because of the sufficiency of Christ. We'll see it. He expresses it in, in, in as clear of an expression of the sufficiency of Christ as you'll find anywhere in Scripture. Verse 10, as we see, then you have put on, so you've, you've let that aside, you've taken it off, you've mortified it, you've put it to death. So you've put on a new self who is being renewed. Now that's, that phrase, being renewed. Notice he didn't say is completely already renewed. This is, this is a sanctification. This is something that is happening ongoingly. You're being renewed. As, as you're being renewed to a true knowledge, according to who? The image of the one who created you. Who created him. The one who put off the old man and has now been clothed with the new man in the righteousness of Christ. This is in the true knowledge now. You know that that's where you once were. There's no, you, you don't have to put up a pretense. Every attribute that's listed in the previous condition, everyone in this room once owned. And from time to time, we actually still pick them up, don't we? And practice them. But by the grace of God, you are being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Verse 11, a renewal in which there is no distinction. Whether, whether you're a part of, uh, of this culture or that culture, whether you're Greek or Jew, whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised. Now this, this would be Paul bringing back one of the previous arguments. 
In, inside of the early church, there was this division between the Jews and the Greeks. We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't even sit in the same room together. <laughs> we, if there's uncircumcised in the place, we have another room for you. You cannot come here to the same place. I mean, it, it's not the same, but listen, you're, you're, you're starting to see a, a rebirthing of a dividing of people. And the, and the government is the one doing most of the dividing now, unfortunately. He's saying here, there is no distinction here. You, you, you have no business of marking one being from this culture and one being from this culture. You have no business to mark one in this spiritual stat, status and this one in that spiritual status. You are together in Christ. And every one of us once were there. But now, we're somewhere between there and fully sanctified. And the fully sanctified, the Scripture will show us, this status comes at the, re, at, at the return of Christ. The completion of. It's com, the, the total satisfaction. The, the total sanctification in Christ is seen in its perfect condition at the return of Christ. But for now, you, you don't need to be segregating yourselves according to nationalities or skin tones or education or lack of education or spiritual status versus spiritual status this is no there there's no distinction between greek and jew circumcised uncircumcised barbarian scythian slave and free man but christ is all it's the sufficiency of christ you're a barbarian <laughs> you got christ you're in you're a highly educated, well-fashioned, well-mannered individual. Well, good for you. But you need Christ. And without Christ, you have no hope whatsoever of ever appeasing the Almighty God. Your only hope is Christ and Christ alone. This would be some of the big, the, the, the great struggle five, over 500 years ago when many people were, were beginning to get a copy of the Word of God in their own hands, in their own language. And they're realizing for the first time, I'm saved because of Christ's work. Not because of my work down there at that, that, that hellish church house that tells me I have to perpetually earn my salvation. They now have a copy of the Word of God that tells them, Christ is your salvation. You couldn't do it. You would never be able to do it. You would never be able to be from there to here unless and, and completely and sufficiently in Christ. It can't, it can't be done. So, verse 12, as those who have been chosen, which will introduce us into the, the doctrine of election that we will examine, Lord willing, next week, Look at it in a closer, more intentional look there. So those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved. So, so to, to, the, to the professor of the Lord Jesus Christ, bought by the blood of Christ, covered by the blood of Christ, the instruction to you is not, here's how you get saved. Because you're already saved. Because everything is in Christ and in all. Christ is, Christ is all and Christ is in all. Your salvation is totally, completely wrapped up in the work, the sufficient work of Jesus Christ. So, in this, because you've been chosen of God, holy and beloved, because you are saved, put on. So here's the, here's the instructions of work, but it's not unto salvation. Here's now, the reality is, you once were not saved, but now you are. Now get ready to work. Because you've got a lot of taking off to do and you've got a lot of putting on to do. And that is a work of sanctification. That is an ongoing, everyday, necessary work that you do that is not buying or earning your salvation. It is because you're saved that you don't want to be there anymore. You're pleased to be here. So we have the sufficiency of Christ. And by the way, let me just give you a quick refresher, reminder. 
that the, that, that the book of Colossians, the Apostle Paul has been speaking about the sufficiency of Christ from the very beginning. And, and so let me just give you quickly a remind, seven, seven places in, in the book of Colossians where he's speaking about the sufficiency of Christ. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. All things were created in Christ. Colossians 1, 19. All the fullness of deity dwells in Him. Truly man and truly God. Third, a third place we see in Colossians is Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 through 29, where Christ, we, we are made complete in Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. Colossians 2, 10, all things are under the authority of Christ. Colossians 2, verse 13, all sins are are forgiven through Christ. And then as we've seen here in, in the 11th verse of Colossians chapter 3, that Christ is all, meaning He's sufficient, and Christ is in all. If we don't, if we don't grasp that, we won't get how sanctification works. Now the Baptist Catechism, question number 39, this is what Spurgeon called the Puritan Catechism. The question is, what is sanctification? I, I hope that you would, you would grow in your understanding and knowledge of what sanctification is. This is how the, the Purit, what Spurgeon called the Puritan Catechism, this is how it answers it. Sanctification is the work of God's free grace by which we are renewed in the whole person after the image of God and are enabled more and more, in other words, ongoingly, to die to sin and live unto righteousness sanctification the longer we walk with God the more we see the things we need to take off and the more we see that we have not taken possession of all of what Christ has given us it, it, it is this perpetual glorious work that Christ has been putting off and putting on daily dying daily living Daily, you're putting off your anger and your wrath and your malice and your slander, your abusive speech and your false witness. You're putting off the old self and its evil cravings and its evil desires. And what are you putting on? We haven't even... We, we, we will look most closely at these uh, next week as we look at, the, at verse 12. But what are we putting on? We're putting a heart of compassion. Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful you're putting off and you're putting on do not forget that you were once there clothed with anger and wrath and malice and slander abusive speech and false witness you once were filled with immorality you once had these attributes that, that are really idolatry of impurity and passions and evil desires and greed. Put them off now, dear believer. Don't put them off hoping that, God, that you will please God to save you, but because of the blood of Christ, put them off today. Lay them aside. They're no longer identity markers of you because that was over there. That was in that last... In your old self. That was your old person. But now you're made new in Christ. So in light of that, perpetually be putting on compassion and kindness, humility and gentleness and patience. Love for one another. Forgiveness is now that which is, which is the, the primary marker for you. Be like the writer of Hebrews when you see each other, rather than stir up wrath and anger and malice inside of each other, stir up one another to do good works. You cannot do this when you're clothed with the old self. Put on Christ. 
today, dear saints. And now, you are the light of the world. It's the Apostle Paul in, in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 where he says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. The apostles recognizing this, in, as long as you are breathing in the temporal day, there is something that needs to be sanctified off of you and sanctified onto you. So, get to work, brothers. Get to work, sisters. Take off and put on. This is what we do now. This is now how we live. This is now what we do. And this is what identifies us perpetually shedding and clothing. And all of this in the sufficient power of the Almighty God. Be strengthened today, dear church.